in any business, like any business, it's like either they're really good at, at sales or they're really good at marketing. Somehow this crazy industry that we're in is like not good at either. And we're just good at taking inbound <laughs> orders and good at word of mouth. We do a good job. We get referrals and it's like purely organic growth. Hey, Printavo Pronounces, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Bruce from Printavo. We've got Mr. Stephen Fair, got at Campus Inc. Uh, awesome episode with sales screen printing coach Kevin Baumgart. We've had him on before. He's got some fire. We're just going to go through and just riff on a ton of stuff. And uh, yeah, it's exciting. But real quick, we've got four awesome sponsors. You know the names. If you guess this one first, be honest, shoot me an email, Bruce at Printavo. I'm going to send you a little gift back. Fair, pick number one. Super color. What do you got? Super color. All right. So first of all, if you know, which you should, they just released their next gen transfer. So this is so much easier to peel and use. We had a really great podcast with Mike and Rum, the owners of Super Color, and they explained that the next gen transfers are easier to peel, which gives you more confidence and it lets you decorate faster because we all know time is money. So they're helping you make out more money. And also they have tested this transfer on so many different types of new equipment, which is absolutely incredible. It makes it so much easier for you guys to use, whether you got a big shop, small shop, super color is there. Printavo one five for 15% off your first order. Thanks guys. Um, after you buy your transfers, make sure you got a good art staffing solution. So graphic source, if you need a solution to approve efficiency and reduce costs in your art department, go to one nine hundred hotstuffcom There you'll meet Mr. Nick Wood, Brent Lucas. Graphic source offers industry leading outsource options for your shop by truly becoming a part of your team. They plug and play with Printavo and other shop management softwares. So when it comes to SEPs, mockups, creative art, order management, embroidery, digitizing, back office admin, or customer service, there's no better company in our industry to work with. They work with hundreds of Printavo shops. We now have three full-time graphics artists and back office admins. So hit them up and uh, you'll get 50% off your first vector, SEP, or embroidery order. Thanks so much, Graphics. 701 and 842 are Campus Inc.'s favorite EasyWay chemicals to clean dirty screens. EasyWay's line of environmentally friendly chemicals will help you get the reclaim job done more efficiently and uh, get onto better things. Um, not only that, EasyWay works with 100 plus distributors uh, around the states to be able to get their stuff out to you. But they are there to help. So you can be able to reach out how to's best practices, questions. Easy way is a really great resource. Um, not only selling great chemicals, but there to be able to help make reclaim run well. Sweet. Thanks. Easy way team. <clears throat> Bruce, have you heard of multicraft underscore daddy? All um, I know is that he has 716 followers. Oh, if you need ink supplies or a daddy, Multicraft Screen Printing and Digital Supplies for over 50 years has been providing you with top brands at competitive prices. Our number one fan, Multicraft Daddy, heard that we wanted to give away some supplies and he answered. So we're sweetening it up. Dave and PMI Tape are giving away one free case of custom Multicraft Daddy branded PMI Tape per episode. Uh, this is for new customers only to win DM and follow Dave subscribe to the podcast, follow PMI tape, leave a nice comment and uh, Dave will pick a new winner every single week. So thanks so much, Dave. We appreciate you. Let's jump on in. Plumbers. All right, everybody. We're back. Hey, Kevin. Um, first of all, Kevin, or I'm sorry, Steven, how's your, your shower leak? water potential has anyone ever problem. had a good experience with a contractor if you have <laughs> please stand up <laughs> comment subscribe like dude contractors are the worst i don't know why either you, you would think or maybe the ones that are good are just really busy and so they just don't accept any work because it's just they constantly get referrals maybe we're too cheap you're too used to business running smoothly and running a good operation not you know used. what I did? You know what I did realize though, Steven, is just that just like when you're hiring people, like you have to interview so many people to get a good one. I think that's the same thing as contractors. So it's only like one out of 15 is actually really good. I usually go with the first contractor I talk to because it's so hard to get a freaking hold of them. <laughs> yeah. The first one that just responds in five minutes, you think is yeah. uh thank you, God. Yeah. Contractors start so strong, but can like when you're in the middle of a job. You just know that whatever's happening during the middle part of the job, it's going to be effed. 
Kevin, you renovate a lot of houses. Yeah, I have zero positive things to say about this topic. It's a disaster, always. Always. I, I just get pictures of Kevin plunging toilets and helping salespeople. <laughs> Mopping, sweeping. Cleaning yeah. fluids off the walls. Cleaning Airbnbs. Yeah, not, not my brightest moment. Uh, yeah, I had a, had a little leak uh, in Indiana at the lake and went there to get the house ready and ended up with a wall busted open and uh, a shower leaking. So that's how I started my week. Bruce, you had a leak too. Yeah, and the water <laughs> heater was just coming out in the garage. So uh, it was just bad soldering. It's funny. The plumber was like, yep, these tend to go out usually about every two years. I was like, new, new what? <laughs> I was like, what? Wait, whoa, whoa. Okay, can you bring a part that doesn't like die after two years or something? And he's like, oh, yeah, let me let me see what I can do. Kevin, what plumbing issues have you had this week? It's zero plumbing issues. I'm uh, <laughs> Cloud nine here. For, He's for like, I've never heard of that word. Well, things happen in threes. So when it when it hits, you just let us know. I appreciate that. I can't wait to fill you in. Thanks. Thanks for jinxing. Okay. Um, Do you want to pre- uh, let me preface this uh, with a quick summary? So Kevin Baumgart, um, if you've heard him on that podcast before, he does a lot of sales coaching. If you haven't heard him before, here's a two minute summary. Uh, Kevin's a VP of sales in the tech world has, has run a lot of big and small sales teams, um, over gosh, I don't know however many years. And we, we met, it's gotta be like eight years ago. I think About it was just me or maybe, no, no, it was like two other people through a uh, Chicago, like tech incubator. Um, and so Kevin since then has been consulting with all kinds of screen printing shops. It's actually pretty wild. Um, how many different types of shops have used him to be able to help from hiring their first sales rep to being able to scale to multiple sales reps to like in the weeds of scripting to commission plan, like all this stuff that I don't think we know as usually first time business owners or people just getting into having a more proactive sales engine. All right. That, I, cover I everything? love that. Thank you, Bruce. And I kind of owe it to you two. Like you all, Bruce, and then introduced me to Steven, brought me into this crazy world of screen printing. And yeah, since that time, I met Steven a little over five years ago, worked with like 70 some shops of all sizes. So yeah, it's been a crazy ride. We brought Kevin in. Kevin, we started probably five years ago. Um, and we like started at, at the basics of, you know, how to script emails and how just just like how to track things and now kevin uh, as an advisor to us works with our team very regularly and uh um our team uh likes meeting with you so you've come on the podcast quite a few times you've spoken at different events um and i think the reason we wanted to have you on one because it's fun because the three of us text all the time and it's it's a fun look into our world but we are getting signs of a slowdown in our industry. Um, a lot of shops saying things are starting to dry out a little bit, economy. And I think in our industry, we are so fortunate because business just comes to us. And if we actually had to run true sales organizations, a lot of us might not be in business right now. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of why we wanted to chat a little bit today is, is shops are kind of looking at things and saying, uh-oh, no um, one. Now what, right? What are you seeing in the world of sales? I mean, you, you're, you're in primarily more of like an outbound world, but are you seeing a slowdown? Are you seeing it getting harder? Is this just chat GPT helping us out now and we're missing <laughs> the curve? What's going on? Yeah, I think like in all business, I'm starting to see definitely slow and, and it just hasn't started. It started last year, right? Um, in talking to screen printers, like most of them, January and February is rough. It's like a really, really rough couple months. Uh, March, kind of in the middle, I'm starting to see a little bit more positivity and just confidence in numbers coming in in April, just in general with the shops that I'm talking to. But it's been it's been a challenging first quarter, first part of this year for sure. I need to get some. I've got. I'm, I put it on my list to to try to use our data better. I know we open source like number of orders created, but I want to do like more dollars centric to maybe get a sense of this, like by shop 
maybe compared to previous year. Yeah, maybe. year over year, year over year growth or year over year stability of revenue. It's on my list to share. Next Kevin, month. do you think that's because of demand? Do you think not as many events going on? Do you think people are you know finding easier providers to use? What do you think is the number one reason why an organization might start sliding or losing sales? Yeah, I mean, all, all, all the above, right? I think the biggest contributor that I'm seeing is like, marketing budgets just getting slashed, right? Like that's one of the first things to go. It's like HR training budgets and then marketing budgets, right? So I think that's contributing to the majority of it. And everybody's being a little bit more conscious. You know, think about the types of industries that we sell into. It's people are tightening up on on specific things. And yeah, unfortunately, apparel, shirts, garments could be one of them. Yeah, I think it's the Fed just... I mean, they want things to slow down, and so they're forcing it to do by the interest rates going higher. It's uh, the government's fault. <laughs> it's a big conspiracy. Sorry, go ahead, Stephen. <laughs> um, no, I was going to say, so we wrote down a bunch of topics, um, and it's fun to just hear you kind of riff Kevin a little bit. Um, I don't know, Bruce, you want a time box, Kevin? How do you, how do you want to do this? Yeah, we'll just we'll just like verbally cut you off in case it goes too in the weeds. But I, I think it'd be cool to yeah, I mean there's literally fifteen topics or so here. What would you say is a good starting off point out of this list here? And Steven, yeah, you've so, got a list here too. Yeah, we we thought about like you know, we a lot of pods do like shop hacks and I wanted to do like sales shop hacks. So these are meant to be like quick hits, like quick things that you can implement to to improve sales and, and drive revenue. And um, by the way, Kevin, if you can like relate this to an, a real shop, maybe that you're working with or like as tactical as possible for people okay. listening to be just, able to, yeah, to just use that. examples from like not just our switch, shop, just, yeah, their just shop Justin, name to Camp just, Justin Lawrence's shop. You can say, okay, this is how <laughs> the does it. Did this. this is how Campus Inc. does it. This is how you should be doing it. Uh, let's, uh, we, we got a good list here. Let's start with, um, let's start with targeted custom drop offs. Okay. Okay. So some of us have been like creating boxes or <clears throat> specific drop offs to, uh, to target to folks. I had a shop that I worked with in Las Vegas that had a really, really interesting approach to this and it was uber successful. So two different options that they did. One was they did really curated boxes. So they they printed on the outside of the, the cardboard. They put a bunch of different items in there, a little bit of promo, mainly, mainly screen printed materials. The investment was around 50 bucks a box. So not a small investment, right? but they use them specifically for warm leads. So this would be someone that just reached out to us for the first time. We're about to put a quote together for someone. We've been trying to court them. We've had a few conversations with them. So they did this specifically for what they would consider more of a warm lead. They saw an 80% success rate on getting deals over the finish line with the people that they sent these boxes to. 50 Damn. bucks, huge And, and, huge and how, many box, how many boxes a week are we talking? Um, I don't know the specifics of that, but I would guess like dozens. This is, this wasn't just like they built five boxes and shipped them out. Like, um, and they also branded them like kitschy slogan on them. I, I won't give away all the details, but yeah, they, they gave a lot of boxes away. Um, one thing that, ha so not only did they close deals because of it, their customers that they sent boxes to also started ordering these boxes for their employees, for their clients. So now they're doing kits for those clients. That's so cool. Hugely successful. The other thing that they did was for cold prospects, they put a single piece of merch into just a branded poly mailer and, and shipped them out or dropped them off. So for cold, it's a little bit different, right? Like I still want to get in front of them, but am I really going to spend a ton of money, time and effort into, into fully branded? Um, super beneficial as well. Two things that I always get asked, should we put our shop logo branded merch in the box or in the bag for the drop off? Or should we print their logo onto something? I don't know if there's a right or wrong there. You got to be a little bit careful with like copyright infringement. Like, are they going to get pissed that you're printing their logo on, on a, a shirt and giving it to them? But think about if you're getting a box, if I got something that a shirt, a hat, a tote bag that had set sales on it, I'm going to use that, right? Yeah, be fired versus, up. versus if it said the shop name on it. So just just something to think about. But I do think targeted 
custom drop-offs is a great hack to drive. Is that drop. why you guys never wear your campusing tie-dye hoodies? Thanks. I wear my campusing tie-dye hoodie all the time. <laughs> Hell that's yeah. Uh, that's, that's, a different, that's a different type of marketing. Um, but I just talked to the CEO of a company called Hoopswag yesterday, a sock company. He said to me uh, his best way to get to get people to respond is find their LinkedIn pictures, print them on socks and ship it to them. That's incredible. Jesus. But he's like, dude, I get a hit rate every single time. It's like you open something up and it says set sales. I think with transfers right now, it's so easy to get that done. Okay. This is super cool. And, and it doesn't have to be a million boxes. It could be like a dozen boxes a week, you know? Yeah. I mean, any, um, like, anything right like think about most shops outbound marketing efforts it's it's usually zero right well i love so, this because it's, it's not like outbound sales it's sort of but the timing of it is i think the crucial part right is sending it when it leads warm instead of you know six months later although maybe it could be a hey don't you know remember us here's something cool Ke six oh, then, oh, if i'm in an outbound campaign with them mm -hmm. and i'm sending them targeted emails or i'm calling having that yeah. drop off be another point of creative outreach right. i think that that Kevin, is it too. better to send, okay, in our industry specific, a box of donuts or a box of merch? Merch all day. All okay. day. It shows what we do, right? It takes all the data we and do. statistics we show that shit. it takes like 12 plus touches for someone to remember your name, your company, what you all do. Yeah. Like no donuts. Yes. Yes. Merch. Uh, Steven, what would you send? So what is the sales limit to a quote that you'd send this out? 5K, what do you mean? 1K, 10K. Like, okay, we get an order in. Um, so there's two there's two situations I see here. One is the warm lead, and you send an order out for let's call or quote out for 5K. Another one is let's say six months later, and you want to make sure that they're just top of mind. Maybe they've ordered X amount or greater. What, what would those numbers be? So I think there's there's two differences. There's, there's VIP say, like VIP like these are our top 20 percent of our customers that we're going to send beautiful gift boxes to because mm -hmm. their life you know their yearly spend with us is over you know 15 20 grand. I think that's another box. Those are Christmas yeah. presents and stuff. But I think what Kevin's talking about is I met you for the first time. I know you have a bunch of events coming up. Um, you guys could be spending twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars with us a year, and I haven't worked with you before, so I'm going to try and flatter you a little bit. Totally. Um, for, for us, I'm looking at you know, um, like our OV is about two thousand dollars, but I'm looking at like how what's their lifetime value to us. If we crack them, how long are they going to last? Uh, this isn't just a fun run, one one and done. This could be a big company, a big organization, a company with a big marketing department, right? We talked to Jeremy Parker from Swag.com that just went to the Facebook secretaries and went straight to them, right? Um, so yeah, I mean these are these are kind of trying to land bigger fish, but anyone that's going to spend a decent amount of money consistently. All right, let's keep going. Wait, r real uh, quick, you brought oh. up a good point there, Stephen. Every shop should have their hit list. 10, 20, 25 companies in their geography that they know they would do a really good job for that would produce a ton of results. You should know who those are. And those are the ones you should be visiting and getting uber creative with and really targeting heavily. Bruce, we went to a shop once that posted the top 50 customers on the wall. That they Remember? wanted or that they had currently? I think that they had currently, but it would be cool to do who you want. Huh. Throw your hit list up there too. Have all of your employees see those companies that you want to target and, and do business with. All right, real quick, I got to tell you something. This is really interesting, and here's why. We formed a company called Inktavo. You may have heard of it, but it has three different brands right now, Printavo, Inksoft, and Graphics. So we're all sister companies now, a big happy family. What we're able to do is Printavo is managing your shop management and workflow organization. Inksoft can run your website and handle online stores at scale, so running multiple different stores for fundraisers, schools, um, company stores and everything in between. And Graphics Flow is a brand new product to be able to help reduce all the back and forth with art. So it has a huge art library that you can put on your website so customers can see and pluck what they want. Plus, you can also be able to collect different ideas and send them to customers to approve as well. Really, really cool. Plus, in app editing, it's like Canva, but specifically for shops. All right. Check it out. All those brands are on inktavo.com. That's inktavo.com. All right, thanks. It's a great idea. You see it more, you you, you know, you you think about it Manifest more, it. you get it done. All I right. like that a lot. Guess what? I've actually I'm going to try that that same idea. Um, I've actually got some PMI tape that we made and um I sent it to some some shots. You want to see this? Printa Check this out. Printavo PMI tape?
Um, well, Ink Tavo. Ooh. Yeah. We're going to bring him um, around and stuff, but anyway, it's funny. <laughs> Get your done. All right. Next up, what do we want to do next? I like the sales commission one just because this comes up actually quite a bit of how do I commission? Do I do gross sales, net sales? Um, do I change it by type of decoration? What do you think? Yeah, let, let's talk Let's talk about this one. Um, a shop that I worked with in Nebraska, we created a commission plan. He had two or three uh, salespeople. We created a commission plan and uh, he, here were his exact words providing clear, transparent, and easily calculated commission plans has definitely had a positive impact on our sales. So like, that's what I want to hear out of a comp plan, that we're creating something that's driving behaviors and driving movement and, and, and closing business on it. What he did, what, what we did together was built a baseline of their team members and the revenue that they were producing. So we looked at the Printavo data and how much they had sold month over month and had a good idea of what each person had sold. If you don't have that data, you got to make some estimations. If you just bring on a salesperson for the first time, you got to do some guesswork here, but hopefully we can look at some historical data and get a good idea of what that baseline should be. Let's say it's 30 grand. I need to sell 30 grand worth of merch month over month as the salesperson. So the way that we structured this would, they had a percent rate of revenue that they would get as a commission for their sales. Let's say it was 3%. So I sell $30,000 of merch. I get 3% of that as a commission on top of my base salary that month. But let's say I sell 50 grand of merch. Now that's at 5% commission. So there's an accelerator as the number, as the amount of revenue that they sell goes up, the percent of commission that we're going to pay off of revenue goes up as well. So what that does is it drives that salesperson to push as much business as they can month in, month out. It really drives that behavior and results in just higher sales, more deals. Yes, we have to pay more commissions, but we're getting more revenue out of them. Kevin, more base salary, less commission, smaller base salary, more commission. What do you think for a shop that's just starting out? Yeah, I mean... Like, look at data in your market. Every every market's a little bit different. I think a 60-40 base to commission is a good place to start. Um, you got to have people comfortable with their base salary, especially as they ramp. Um, maybe even a guarantee on commissions for the first few months, you know, get them to the point where they feel comfortable. You don't want people to start looking for a job right away if they're not hitting it out of the park in the first few months. It's, and it takes a couple the, months to ramp up too. I think that's the mm -hmm. thing we don't realize at first. What I've learned is that you have to prove it to that salesperson in the first like 90 days that this does work. Because if it if you set up a system that does not work for them and they don't feel it, if you don't show success there, they won't. It won't work. Kevin, there's one rule you always teach me uh, when I'm building comp plans. You say like set clear expectations that this will change. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So especially if you haven't done this before and this is the first time you're building it, you, you have to communicate. Like communication is so key, especially when it's tied to my well-being, my compensation, right? The amount of money that I'm going to make. We have to communicate that this, this isn't always the case. We're going to be at a point where either the comp plan is too rich for the company and it doesn't make sense for the employee or it's way too rich for the employee and doesn't make sense for the company. And we're going to have to make edits and, and tweaks and shifts. It's hard um, to claw it back, huh? It, it's harder to claw it back. Yes. But it's, but it's easier to say, Hey, we're going to make, we're going to make changes. And if you communicate that up front, Hey, the only thing that I'm going to promise you in this comp plan is that we're going to make some changes at some point. Most, you know, sales organizations are changing comp plans every six months annually for sure. But every six months, sometimes depending on how fast the business is growing. Um, you, go ahead, Kevin. Or go ahead, Bruce. You taught me this, Kevin, a while ago, and it's so true. And it happened. Well, first of all, we changed our commission plan probably twice a year, every year, <laughs> um, because we wanted to like continue motivating the right thing. But that was the key: is that the commission people will hack to the fullest. So, yeah, and, and they're salespeople, right? So, a good salesperson, you want to, you want them to make more money. And, uh, you know, if you're motivating, it turns out the wrong thing or you think, oh, well, they'll do it. Like it will happen over time and you'll notice that. And so that For requires sure. a slight adjustment. But yeah, we, we changed it often. And we also verbally said that is, is exactly as Kevin, you did that. Kevin, can you, if you're just starting out a comp plan and say it's your first salesperson 
inbound versus outbound sales, the lead that might just come through the door versus the lead they're going to go out and get. If you don't have a good system to track it, how, what advice would you give a shop that's trying to come out with a commission plan? Yeah, for sure. In that scenario, way harder for me to go out outbound, win a net new customer, new logo that we've never done business before versus work an existing current customer structure. There should be different percentages in in my opinion at, at what you pay them. The challenge is, is this gets money, right? You have to, in my opinion, have really, really clear expectations on what you want this person to do. Because if you say you can go find your own, find your own outbound business, but you can also work our current customer base and work inbound leads, the easy thing is to work inbound leads and current customers, right? Like that's what they're going to do. They're going to spend the vast majority of their time on that. It's easy. It's left less lift, less rejection, less going outbound. So you, you got you got to be really clear on what they're doing. My my thought is you got to break that up. You got to have someone that's an outbound seller that that's all they do. And when they close a deal, they're passing and transitioning that relationship off to the customer success team, account management team, inside sales team, whatever that is. And that outbound salesperson is probably getting commission. Usually we structure it out like 12 months, but they're not doing anything post bringing that customer on. And it's on our inbound team to manage it. The problem that I see a lot of shops with is they'll, they'll take their customer success person that maybe isn't good at outbound and they'll throw them in, throw them at outbound and have them go sell. They're not good at it. They don't like it. And that's not what they want to do. It it very, very seldom works. We struggle with this a lot at Campus Inc. because usually the person that sources the order wants to continue building that relationship, wants to continue working with them. Um, And so something we're trying to talk about is building a true sales org means having account executives and account managers and that they are two different things. Yeah. Would you say, Kevin, the account executive or the person that gets the first sale, they make a good amount of money on that first one, and then you said they still continue to make money for 12 months? Yeah, think about it. The first order we get from a customer maybe not be that heavy, but then over the 12 months, we do a good job with them. They continue to grow. That's not fair for me as the account executive bringing in that first deal. We got, we got to give them some runway and continue to pay them out. Um, all of that being said, I know most shops are in a situation where we have like one customer facing person. Like that doesn't mean that it can't work to have someone sell outside and work inside and work current customers, but you'll see it really quickly. They're going to gravitate towards the easy work, taking inbound leads, working current customers. And yeah, that's probably I had when we first started, it was very much flat, like didn't really matter in or out. And now as things have started to like sway, Now we're really starting to build it out. But we started really simple with uh, almost like an 80-20 model where it was like, here's your salary. It wasn't a commission as much as it was like a bonus. It was like, here, you just get a percent. Here you go. Sure. Um, Sure. But it didn't motivate. And now what we're working on, Kevin, is how to motivate the right activities so that they're not just looking at inbound leads. <laughs> and that's that's a measure of a good comp plan, right? They should read that comp plan and be motivated to want to do those activities, focus on those behaviors because it's going to drive them commission in the in the back end. How often should you pay out commission? Monthly. End of the month of April, I'm paying May 15th for April commissions. Gives you 15 days to reconcile and confirm that it's there, but as instant of gratification as possible, better. Should the salesperson be managing their own commission tracker or should that be their manager? Both. And that was one of the things that that, that shop in Nebraska mentioned. It's like the ease of ease of calculation. I, as a salesperson for every single order that I'm quoting, should know the exact dollar amount that I'm going to make. And I should be able to really, really easily track where I'm at either via CRM or just a manual commission tracker. It doesn't have to be uber sophisticated. Put a Google sheet or an Excel sheet together where I'm dumping in all my orders, total revenue, my percent commission and how much I've made like month to date and where I'm trending. We, um, we use Zapier when an order process through Printavo, it spits out into a spreadsheet and then it gets filtered by, um, salesperson. Salesperson. Yeah. Um, so Matt Marcotte, he'll help you out there. All right, Bruce, what's, what else? Uh, I, just a last thing on this. The only issue I've found that happens when the sales and sort of account management team separate is it creates this like internal angst almost Riff. of like, yeah, of like, oh, well, you didn't manage the account right. And then now they're gone or, or you didn't like the handoff wasn't good, or, you know, from the success team or um, they were sold on something we can't do. The success will say of the sales team. Um, you know, is that just more of good management and cultural, you know, keeping them together or what do you think? Yeah, there's, there's always a little bit of, you know, animosity between sales and customer success. Like 
sales sells the dream, customer success services the nightmare, right? Like that's the that's the adage. Uh, so I do think it's a it's a function of culture. I think there's always going to be a little bit of that. I think maybe it's a little bit more apparent software than it is Bruce and like screen printers. I think for the majority of the time, like we do a really good job for our clients and keep them. Like we don't lose clients often. Churn isn't there. So I think less of a challenge and of a concern, but something you, you'll have to go through and communicate well on and yeah, coach to both sides. Cool. It's interesting, yeah, I, uh, Bruce, a really good example of this in our industry is how our reps work at SNS, Sanmar and Alpha. They have an inside team and they have an outside team. And like our rep is coming to our shop quarterly, coming to meet us, maintaining the relationship. And our inside, we just send everything to. And the two of them are like a tandem. And I feel like those bigger kind of old school businesses do a good job of it. So it might, might be interesting if you're a shop to like start to observe that dynamic. Because I've I seen did, it very apparent. Yeah, I did see a lot of efficiency once that team was split versus just a sales rep managing the whole thing. And we were able to take in more and do more. Um, so that was good. Okay. Uh, I, I've got down here negotiating gold that you wrote down. You want to yeah. talk about that? Let's, let's talk about negotiating. So... Shops are usually pretty polarized on this topic. Like uh, some shops will be like, I am not negotiating at all. Hard no. Like my price is my price and uh, we're, we're focused on quality and some mm -hmm. will negotiate. I don't think there's, there's a right or wrong answer. Um, but yeah, here, here's my hack for negotiating. Um, first of all, when someone asks for a, a discount, we should push back at least once. People just ask because it's what they've been taught, right? Like it's, it's America. Bruce teaches me. Always ask. Yeah, it feels good. good. I'm ready to go. You give me five, 10%, I'm ready to Bru go. Bruce, but Bruce is a not. coupon clipper. <laughs> I love it. It's love the it. psychological thing for me. Anyway, go ahead. So, it works. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. psychological and you should ask. It's what you've been ta taught. Like, But that doesn't mean that we need to give in. My recommendation is like push back on, on first pass of asking for a discount. Um, and the, the approach is triple a, the first a is acknowledge. So I'm going to walk through what this looks like. Um, I'll actually go through all three acknowledge answer and ask. So, so three a's. So someone asked for a discount, acknowledge that ask, appreciate you making the ask here. A lot of our clients pushed us for better prices as well. Now answer, they often come back to us and say they are happy and are willing to pay more. Once they saw the quality of product that we were able to provide in the service level that we provided, I'm confident that we can meet your expectations if you just give us the opportunity. And now the third A, ask, can we go ahead with this order and circle back once it's complete to get your thoughts? Most people forget to do the last one. Huh? Acknowledge, answer, ask. I get it. I know we're a little bit more pricey. I'm, I'm confident that we'll be able to uh, do good work for you and that you'll be satisfied. Can we just go ahead with this order at the propose cost and circle back after. Interesting. Uh, I was listening to a podcast, like a sales podcast that says like uh, one of the biggest mistakes people will do is when they start negotiating, the salesperson will start to defend. Well, we've got these costs and this cost and this cost. That doesn't matter. It's like the confidence in saying like, no, 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 this is the quality. I'm not explaining it. Okay. Can we work together? I'm, I'm glad um, you mentioned confidence that, that paragraph that I just talked through, they have to be super confident, well rehearsed. It has to be dialed. They have to feel really, really good about, um, especially if they're going to object and not follow that, that negotiation or not discount. You got to be really pointed and communicate that really well, really confidently. The triple A plan. Triple like A. It. The, the other thing from a negotiation perspective, so go with that. That's maybe a little bit more of an aggressive approach. A softer approach would be just asking them, you know, you can do AAA again, or you can ask them, would you be open to us suggesting a creative way to try to get within that budget or what you're trying to accomplish? So you can look at, you know, garment quality, reducing colors, art, artwork, quantities, whatever, right? There's a lot of levers that we can pull to negotiate. Um, negotiation should be a give and take on both ends. It shouldn't just be us giving concessions. So if we don't want to go with that aggressive approach, we can soften it up a little bit and say, hey, I can probably get to 15 bucks a shirt, but there's some things that we would have to change. Here's a couple of recommendations that I have. So you're not just giving a discount. I feel like car, car salesmen will be like, okay, you only want to spend 30 grand. There's a 2009 over there. You know, yeah. no, 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 no. But I want the nicer car. Okay. You know, <laughs> is there any grease fairing that you give to, to let, like free shipping or, um, you know, something to, if you feel that that'll make it happen. 
my best customers don't negotiate with me. <laughs> They're just price, yeah, my, yeah, let's go. My my biggest customers, when I tell them my price, they are like, okay, here's a PO. <clears throat> it's usually the smaller customers. I think <clears throat> it's important to differentiate who's spending whose money. Uh, so, please talk about this because we were texting about this and I think it's complete gold. Okay. Negotiating if gold. If you're a buyer for a company, you have a, you know you know the window of how much things cost. And if something fits in your like, hey, this is this and this. I like the person. All right, let's do it. Or if you are the marketing department or you're a secretary, you're just trying to get it off your desk. And so as long as everything looks good and the person likes you, someone else is paying the bill. It really negotiation, I feel like happens more when it's like someone buying and it's coming out of their wallet or it's really going to affect them. And they're you trying said to the, the owners, best. founder, what? owner, a founder yeah. or an owner. Yeah. Like if I'm buying, you know, if, I, if I'm buying something for my business <laughs> that I'm going to be shopping around and stuff like Bruce, you look for the cheapest computer mouse on Amazon, right? Like. <laughs> it's it's what you do, right? Uh, and so the pain points, like, yeah, it's it's a lot harder. Kevin, you talk about this. You talk about it a little better than I do. About who who your customer is and how to kind of profile them and 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 in in that way, like, yeah, how you're yeah, able so to negotiate. You you can look at this as like buyer persona, right? Like a champion. I, I'm the. And the champion, I'm going to buy it. It's for my department. I need it, but I need an economic buyer that's involved as well. My head of finance, you know, the, the president to, to check off. Um, we got to make sure that we're aligning to all those, those buyer, the buyer needs, but you're right. It's like, if it's my money, my business, I might scrutinize this a little bit more, or I, I'm in finance. I own the budget. Um, that's why it's important to ask about the decision-making process, who's all involved, who would feel left out if they weren't involved early on in the discovery to make sure that we're aligning to how we're proposing and who we're, who we're talking to. And that's why our last episode, we did a lot on online stores. That's why we, we charge retail prices because the parent just wants a store built. They don't care, you know? Yeah. Um, that's really, that's some gold there. All right, Bruce, what's next? Is there anyone you want to pick? You think it's good? I, I'm, uh, uh, let's, let's do Stevens. Steven brought up one myths of a CRM solve all. This, okay. this, was, this was interesting. I get asked so often. It's like, hey, what CRM should I use? And I think like a lot of shops think about if I implement a sales CRM, I'm going to sell. And it's like the, CRMs are important and they're really, really good at helping sales teams to stay organized. But how about like, what's your target strategy? Who are you reaching out to? What's the outbound game plan? What, do you have role, responsibility, KPIs set, comp defined for that salesperson? Do you have a sales process? Do you have messaging scripts? Like, there is so many important things to build out a, a sales organization and, and go outbound effectively. Again, that's usually why people reach out. They want to start going outbound. A CRM is a small, small component of that. An important component but there are a lot of structure and framework and things that need to be built and defined before we just go out and get a CRM and think that it's going to solve all of our problems. I've made this mistake. Um, <clears throat> do tell a, a few too many times. Um, I think I've tried every single one out. Pipe drive, nutshell, Salesforce. Salesforce. We, we did a $50,000 try to build that. Never went live. Today we're on HubSpot. <laughs> Ours is still in progress. Yeah. Today we're on HubSpot. Uh, and I think it goes back to this. So Kevin, when you taught us sales, we learned Google Sheet sales. Um, and so the hardest part about using a CRM is adoption and management. You almost need a full-time sales manager. It cannot be the owner totally. to manage a CRM. And it, it's, it's, some, it's, it's not easy to do. And so I get that question a lot. Um, and I think it's like start in Google Sheets and, and run, run your business out of a playbook right there. And then at some point, get in there it's really hard to get one that sticks. Um, it's, it's not easy. It's it, the CRM is only as good as the people that are putting the data in the data inputs are that that's the value of your CRM. But if you do hold people accountable to doing that, it can provide a lot of value, like just content management, right? Like all of the communications that I've had with a specific lead or a specific company or contact, I can organize and see really, really clearly in one place. And 
as a salesperson running a book of business or a pipeline, or as a manager, owner, founder, helping that salesperson, we have visibility into deals that are in our pipeline, going through the sales process, where they are, what we're forecasting. We can strategize on deals. There's a lot of big advantages of a CRM, but it's like, you know what, it's, it's like one of the most common questions that I get. It's like, do you have a sales process in place? Do you have good scripting language? Do you have the right people, <laughs> people doing the sales? Yeah, that, that you, you can run it on. right out of Gmail. Nick Wood has a tool he uses in his Gmail called like Streak, I want to say. And it just yeah. organizes his inbox by where customers are in the pipeline. That's it. And I for him, he's called, like, yeah, what is it? I don't know. Strike, uh, streak, strike, something like that. But um, you don't need anything technical. Um, one one tool that I'll say that I really enjoy using, uh, it's either called MailTrack or on front is it'll show us red receipts how often people open their email, read it, and it'll create activities based on that. So if someone opens an email, doesn't respond to it, or it goes undelivered, it lets me know. Um, and so when we were emailing Mark, we could see how many times he opened it. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Cuban. There, Hello, there, Mr. Are, Cuban. there are a couple tools like that. Yesware is another one. Like You should know if people forwarded it on, how many times they opened it, did they click on links within it? You should know all that data. And as a salesperson... If I'm blind to that and I'm just sending out email campaigns, I'm at a huge disadvantage. I want to know who's opening it. And whenever I get that yes, we're notification, I'm picking up the phone and though it's creepy, it's like, hey, it's Kevin. I just saw you open my email. I wanted to see if you know, we could talk about this more, right? Like it's, Damn, you know, get them in the time when smart. they're on it. <laughs> Wait, let me, uh, so yes, yes, Y-E-S, W-A-R-E dot com. Stephen mm -hmm. mentioned. Ma mail track is a tool, streak. And then yes. front is the email tool we use just in our company and that one has really good um, it's front app and then mm -hmm. mail track .io. yeah that's a gmail plugin uh sweet good stuff is that is that by the way your text setup is that so like you send an email out through your gmail and then you just use yesware and you get that like notification like you said to reach out again me no, for Kevin, like what, uh, do you Kevin, what do you do? So, so for, I mean, my structure is a little bit more sophisticated. For, I'd rather talk about like for a shop, you need yeah. some sort of email automation platform. <laughs> Kevin's like, yeah, I actually have a AI bot. It's just like, I don't really do anything. So <laughs> everything's automated. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so you need an email automation tool. This could be MailChimp, Constant Contact. It could be built into your CRM. Like HubSpot has an email automation platform. Pipedrive has a really good one. It's super simple. Um, so like that outbound email campaign should automatically, yes, it's getting sent via your email server via Gmail, but that the copy of that email and the, the activity history goes into the CRM as shown that I sent this email and then read receipts. All that stuff is either managed through that app, the apps that we talked about or through the CRM, usually in the CRM, if you get HubSpot or, uh, pipe drive, you'll be able to see open opens. Kevin, uh, can we talk? Can we talk about emails for a second? Just blanket templates versus personalized emails. How do you send the perfect cold? Yeah, because the campaigns don't really work with the personalizing. Sort of. I mean, you, you can though. So, like, here's here's what I'll do with most shops. They'll go. I'll I'll have them download Uplead or some lead generation tool, and they'll build, let's say, a construction company or trades list of owners of construction companies and their geography within this size, and they've got all these emails. Now they're sending an email campaign just to those folks and they're putting language around, you know, reliable, uh, durable uniforms for your teams. We're working with, you know, the top 10 construction companies in my, our geography. So they're putting that language in that actual campaign to make it personalized, but they're also automating it then so that they're not having to manually customize each email. It's customized in, a, in an automatic campaign. And you can, if you get savvy, you could put, in Google Sheets, you can write a like custom personalized message that would inject it every time. I don't know. I really yeah, it's like, like your first name. It's like pulling data out of the, the lead list that you have. Yeah. I really like sending personalized emails or trying to do some research and find something interesting about them. Um, I don't know. I get a ton on LinkedIn all the time. And the ones, the people that like stalk me really well and like find something about me, like, oh, I heard about this on this. I'm like, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but to your point, I don't know. 
Yeah, I, 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 like, I, think I like personalized emails. It's a little bit of both, right? It's it's a quantity game. It's a numbers game, but it's also quality. Like for maybe our, our I'm not throwing our top 20 hit list that we talked about into a heavy email campaign, but I might throw, you know, this 50, 100 lead list that I downloaded cold into a into an automated campaign less personal. Okay, so go ahead, Bruce. Uh, you want to go to the KPIs one? Because I think this relates to the contribution margin we just talked about. Sort of uh, around pricing, as far as okay. The question was that you wrote down. Oh, you, yeah, you frame it. So the way I want to frame it is uh, when Kevin works with us, we talk a lot about scorecards and activity tracking, and we have this thing at Campus Inc. that Kevin has ingrained in us. It says like activities yield results. Some of them are quantitative, qualitative, but you have to be able to track them and very easily do it. Kevin, can you talk about activity tracking for a sales team building a KPI scorecard? what that all entails and what might be on there. It, it yeah, relates it's... to like a shop with like maybe one rep to, you know, five, obviously Steven's got a lot. So. Yeah. I, I don't think, I don't think that it necessarily needs to change heavily based on the, the size of the org. Um, it's, it's like inputs equal outputs. So, and it doesn't have to be sophisticated. Like we don't have to set up this heavy CRM reporting structure, um, my recommendation is like touches. So emails, calls, LinkedIn messages, we should set a goal and we should track to the sales team member at how they're doing all of those things. And maybe it's some net new, some current customer. Again, that should be defined. So now I've got my weekly goal. I know how many calls, how many emails, how many LinkedIn, how many texts, whatever the, whatever those input metrics are, those create the output, those focus on output then. The more inputs, the better inputs, the, the more and better outputs, which would be, you know, meeting set, net new opportunities created, jobs quoted, deals closed, revenue for those deals, uh, average job size, right? So now I've got, again, goals and some weekly like estimations, but then actuals week over week. And now I'm just like, I usually recommend doing it in just a Google sheet so everyone has access to it. And now... I, as a salesperson, have visibility into it, but founders, owners, leaders, they have visibility into it. If it's owner-led sales, they're accountable to it now. They can see it. They can track it. But all of this, like, from accountability is one thing, but we don't want to, like, super micromanage our salespeople and, like, hey, you didn't make 40 calls this week. What's up? Um, it should be to allow them to better understand their effectiveness. Once we get inputs and outputs, we can understand ratios. It takes me a hundred touches to get one meeting. It takes me two meetings to usually quote a job. It takes me uh, two quotes. My close rate is 30, per, 35%. It takes me about two quotes to uh, get a deal. And that deal average job size is about 1500 bucks. Now I can better understand and back into my $30,000 quota that I need to hit monthly. That's incredible. I, you know, it's funny that you talk about um, the inputs we so we have someone that qualifies. So if someone signs up for a trial for Printabo, they, um, we have someone that calls him as soon as possible to qualify and make sure that, hey, this is the right tool for you or not. Um, when that person was able to see how many uh, demos they were able to book off, like within 30 days, they, and I just built a custom thing in Excel because I didn't know how otherwise to do it. Um, they were able to increase that because it was just... Uh, you know, they just had a bit more visibility to help try stuff. Why, Bruce, you said they try to call them as quick as possible. Why? Um, our goal was to get them. So if somebody sends up for a trial, they're obviously looking for software now. And uh, we want to convert them to a demo within the first 30 days. But ideally, as soon as possible. She's commissioned, though, off of the first 30 days of booking a demo. So the ability for her to see the ratio of how many she booked out of the total just helped her self, you know, coach to increase that number. So what you're hearing about is like a sales development rep, right, Bruce? Yeah. And their only incentive is set demos, set demos, set demos that yeah. are qualified. Yeah. And they're not even responsible for take, closing it. I haven't seen a lot of shops take hold of this, but this is interesting. Like if we're trying to drive outbound growth and we're trying to go out and find that new business, why, why haven't shops brought in SDR, sales development representatives? That's all they do all day, every day is call, email, LinkedIn, and schedule meetings. Schedule the meetings for the owner, for the founder, for the salesperson. 
we, we don't see that happen often. And, and I just want to touch on Bruce's point about the response times. All of the data shows that the quicker the response times are, magic number has always been talked about as five minutes. If we can get back to them within five minutes, conversion goes up by like 80%. So for, for leads that come in, which the vast majority of shops, that's how they grow revenue. That's their revenue is inbound leads. Co lead coverage, I better be hitting all of those. And lead response time are the two metrics that I should be tracking. Get back to them as quick as possible because they're probably pinging a bunch of other shops with the same need. Usually the first person that pings them has a much higher likelihood of converting that lead. Okay, Kevin, you talk about demos and setting demos. You, you kind of made up this thing of like... Print shop owners do this quote and hope thing. Can you talk about quote and hope? The old quote and hope. Uh, you yeah, need we a shirt about that the, says that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, where we, we send a quote the, uh, and just just hope it comes in. The, what? the last podcast. This is um, this is more like later on in the sale in the sales process after we've provided pricing, and it's just like then we just hope that they're gonna hope that they're gonna you know move forward, and that's it. Um, and I think. I think shops that use Printavo or shop management software that where they can really easily send the, the mock-up for approval and then send the invoice for payment. It makes that a little bit easier to quote and hope because I can just push all these buttons and it's automated and it, the workflow is there. I'm recommending most shops that they, after they quote, they get them on the phone, usually a zoom share a screen and walk through what they put together and why. And if you mm. did a good job of uncovering their needs up front and pain points, challenges, what they're really looking for, not just sizes, quantity, color, logo placement, what they really need, what's the goal of the order, what are they trying to accomplish? We can then, when we're showing them the quote, actually talk about how we're aligning to those needs and we took that into consideration and then jump over to the Printavo screen and walk through the quote or screenshot that Printavo screen, dump it into a slide, right? And review it from there. Um, that's, the, yeah. Is quote and hope is like, yeah, don't like set some follow up, make sure we're there. Don't just quote and let it, let it die. One of my biggest pet peeves is when a lead comes in and our sales team just sends them a quote right away. I'm like, have we talked to them? Do we know their needs? Should we give them a ring? Should we ask a couple of questions first? Oh no, they're just looking for pricing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can, can, we, can we rip off another one of these getting to need quickly? Let's do it. Sure. We talked about it a little bit of, trying to uncover, um, uncover that need. The need is important, but getting to it quickly is important. I'm starting to work with more shops around that maybe have less of a concern of, I need to go outbound more of a concern with, I have all this inbound coming from all these different areas, DMS, web, web forms, uh, they're emailing, they're calling, they're stopping in. I just worked with a shop in Pennsylvania and we were working through how to streamline and really optimize their online quote form process. So what they wanted to do is put everything to their online form. So if people came in on DMs and Instagram or they stopped in, it was all, you got to fill out this form first. And they broke it down into ready to order, know exactly what I want or need help. Give me some info on what you're looking for. And now it's like someone walks in, they hand them a tablet, they fill it out right there. Someone calls, they said, what's your email? I'm going to send you this link to an online form. So they're, they're funneling everyone through that. And the one question that I gave them that they mentioned was making a huge impact is um, if you had to pick one, what would you say is most critical to you in this order? And you're listing out in a drop down speed, quality, cost. So now they have a little bit more information on what's really critical versus just going off of sizes, quantity, color, logos, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that if they say cost, it's not a, the right fit for us. But it is some indication on how we need to approach that opportunity. And then hopefully I'm jumping on the phone with them. I'm having a conversation. I can dig deeper into that need. Hey, you mentioned quality was most important to you. What does that mean to you? Why is that important to you? You know, think about a brewery, retail. We want yeah. this to be their favorite shirt. We want them to wear it. It's free marketing for us. All I care about is quality, right? You hear that from tap room managers often. That is what we need to hear. And without asking that question and digging deep into need, we're not gonna. We're not gonna get there. This is powerful. Can, can we, we do? Uh, yeah, uh, no. Two. We always try to cut these, Kevin, at, at an hour. I don't like going beyond that. But um, can we do a part two? Are you free? Yeah. 
Yep. Yes. Kevin, right, cool. uh, for shop owners that are listening to this, how do they get in touch with you? What does yeah. like a typical thing look like? I know you're pretty selective in that like you you don't just work with anyone ever, all the time. How does it work? Yeah, so um, it's Kevin at setsales.co. Setsales.co is the site. Um, I'm usually like working with the shop to better understand what what the concern or challenge is. Like most of the time, it's we want to drive revenue. Like January and February is a lot of we're hurting. It's like we need to go out and proactively find business. Um, so that's the majority of the the questions that I get in. And so I'll want to really dive into what's in place today or learn and understand. In some instances, we're building Uber custom you know, packages like the shop that I just mentioned in Pennsylvania, like it was, it was a custom package to try to figure out not only how to optimize inbound order flow, but then like good responses. We scripted out some messaging and some language, but the vast majority of the shops I'm working on need like a structured sales process. They need scripting. They need KPIs. They need a commission plan. They need to figure out how to recruit and hire onboard salespeople. So I'm building these structured projects that are customized to, to shops and helping them, you know, improve sales and improve how they run sales within their, within their shops. Kevin, how, if you, okay, you've worked with 70 shops, how much opportunity or upside do you think a shop is losing by not having a sales organization? Oh, it's like, yeah, it's pro- maybe unpopular opinion. I just think about all of the, the vast majority of my career experience has been early stage venture backed entrepreneurial, like growth companies. I, in any business, like any business, it's like either they're really good at at sales or they're really good at marketing. Somehow this crazy industry that we're in is like not good at either. And we're just good at taking inbound (laughs) orders and good at word of mouth. We do a good job. We get referrals and it's like purely organic growth. I think about your company, Bruce. So Printavo started, you guys were an inbound content marketing machine. You got all of your leads coming from all of the content that you were putting out, right? Mm -hmm. And then you grew a sales organization. So you checked the marketing box and then you did sales. You're doing both. Shops don't do that at all. It is such a huge miss. And I just think about if we implemented like even a part of the strategies that I've implemented at like software companies, huge, huge advantage, huge opportunity for shops to get way, way better at the side of the business and actually own revenue and drive a more predictable revenue stream to the business, not just rely on inbound. And I, and I think to that point, to wrap it up, once you crack the nut of building a sales organization, then it's just fueling it up, yeah. which is yep. really cool. And so like yep. our biggest growth <clears throat> has happened in the last year or two, because now it's like, okay, we've got people in place. We have managers in place. All right. Double the sales team. <laughs> added a, you know, yep. add a couple million dollars. Um, but so it's that's, that initial investment though. You invested in that early. It's like a lot of shops won't invest in a, a appointment center, a door opener service. It's like you pay for the appointments. Like you're going to get deals out of it and they're going to be a repeat customer. Pay a couple hundred bucks for someone to set a meeting for you. Like you got to invest in this stuff early, just like they're investing in equipment and improving production. You got to invest in the front end of the business as well. Mm. Someone asked me, I saw in a text thread, if I had 100K, what equipment would I buy? And I said, two salesmen. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Genius. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing happened. Or until one an outsource, and an, uh, and an outsource manager. Yeah. <laughs> this is good. This is good. Uh, we appreciate it. So yeah, um, Kevin, we'll have to do a part two. Yeah. This, Kevin this really- at sales.co. <laughs> we'll, we'll set you up. Uh, appreciate you guys listening to this episode. Hopefully it was super helpful. I, I'm just... Um, taking everything in writing notes constantly so we can share it in the description we appreciate you we'll see you on the next printable pronounces podcast bye